There's no objection from members. Why don't we start the meeting? The mayor's on the way, and uh, when she gets here, we will welcome her. Uh, so this is um, a meeting of the New Columbia Statehood Commission. Uh, I believe that this is our first meeting of 2018, our last meeting having been on December 6, 2017, I believe, and so we're a little behind in having the necessary number of meetings per year. I'm Phil Mendelson, Chairman of the Council of the District of Columbia and a co-chair of the Commission. And present uh, are, uh, to my left, Senator Michael Brown and Representative Franklin Garcia, and to my right, Senator Paul Strauss. I will recognize them in a moment. Uh, we have several items of business, as well as receiving information from uh, Beverly P Perry, who's the Senior Advisor to the Mayor, and is responsible for a lot of the statehood work that the government is doing. Um, as I said, the mayor is on her way, but I just heard she might be another 10 minutes or 15 minutes. The, um, at the end of the agenda, we will have an opportunity for public comment. If there are any issues that, um, member, uh, that citizens who are present want to bring up. Um, with that, let me turn to a colleague, uh, Senator Strauss. If you have an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today. Uh, we have some uh, business items that we must do pursuant to our statute and operating regulations, and that's to approve the spending plan pursuant to the fiscal year 2018 budget. I look forward to presenting that. Uh, we've had an exciting year of achievements, including um, generating international attention at the European Parliament where uh, the United States was called out along with other countries for violating the human rights of, uh, of its citizens, namely the lack of voting rights. Uh, additionally, the international uh, observers sent by the OSCE to observe U.S. elections uh, found that the lack of enfranchisement of D.C. voters uh, constitute a violation of our citizens' obligations for free and fair elections. And so, as we present our budget, I'm encouraged by some of the fruits that these international uh, efforts are, are bringing, uh, and I look forward to uh, enhancing those efforts in, in the coming year. Obviously, these international efforts are aimed for the primary purpose of influencing our own elected officials here in Washington, D.C. Uh, as we've seen from historical precedent, the lack of democracy uh, and the attention that these international organizations put on the United States in a negative way uh, has been successful in influencing, in particular, Republican members of the Senate uh, some years ago when they were called upon to support what was then the D.C. Voting Rights Bill. We think that these efforts will continue to be successful uh, as we move forward with our agenda this year. Obviously, it's just a small portion of our outreach. We continue to work with targeted states, uh, the media, our 51 Stars campaign, and others. Um, but I look forward to uh, taking you through the dynamics of, uh, of that as we go forward uh, on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Scott. Senator Brown? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to read a brief statement so I don't leave anything out. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the first of our legally mandated semi-annual semi meetings of the new Columbia State Commission. The fact that we gather here in the 11th hour for the first time in more than a year speaks volumes. Although statehood is touted as a priority for the district, regrettably, our elected delegation is not a priority. As we approach a new year, a new Congress, a renewed, a renewed chance to move forward, the lack of support for those of us elected by the people to carry forth the mantle of DC statehood is troubling. Since the day when future President Andrew Jackson was elected as the first shadow representative from Tennessee, every jurisdiction that has used the Tennessee plan has successfully achieved statehood with the exception of District of Columbia. Here in the district, the plan has been altered to accommodate the desires of local elected officials instead of facilitating the will of the people. As a result, the commission envisioned to support our delegation has become a mechanism to control and diminish it. We are the only citywide elected officials who receive no compensation. We are the only locally elected citywide officials 
prohibited from receiving government matching funds. We are the only elected officials, including ANC commissioners, whose offices do not transfer into the new state uh, that we helped create by the Constitution of the wrote in 2016. We are, in fact, the only delegation that has been completely removed from the Tennessee plan since 1896. In addition, funding for our offices is anemic, with each office receiving only about 8% of what a council member gets to run their office. As a consequence, our, as a consequence, our effectiveness as officially elected state representatives of the 700,000 residents of District Columbia has been seriously encumbered. Although I regret that our delegation is the first in more than 200 years not to be fully supported by the government that created it, it is what it is, and um, I feel obligated to take that, uh, to accept that, and move forward by virtue of my office. I have therefore created a nonprofit organization to help su supplement the pittance that is now doled out to us and to carry out the important work with which I have been charged. We recently held our first big event, which sold out, and I would like to thank my colleagues for contributing to that event and helping making it a expansion success. The co-chairs of the commission, of course, were also invited, but true to form, they declared they declined to participate. Since last we met, I've also lobbied every Republican office on the Hill, which, which has co-sponsors for the Puerto Rican statehood bill in an attempt to get our first Republican co-sponsor. I was a keynote speaker before representatives from 70 nations at the annual Horaces International meeting in Cascai, Portugal. I will again be a featured speaker there at their annual conference in April. Uh, I continue to have a weekly internet radio show and social media outreach program that reaches hundreds of thousands of people a year and is singly the most prolific social media outreach program for statehood to date. Most recently, I presented a session on D.C. statehood at the National Council for Social Studies in Chicago, a gathering of more than 4,200 social studies teachers from around America. We also continue our work with schools across America through our website, teachdemocracy.net. For the past eight years, I've done this job full time. Now we're at a pivotal moment in our movement. We have 208 co-sponsors on congressional legislation that would make us a state. We have an opportunity to retake the Senate in 2020 with three times as many Republican senators up for re-elections. Prospects for de Democrats regaining the White House are improving. This is a time for us to use every tool at our disposal to achieve our goal of becoming the 51st state, especially these offices that have been historically so effective. We should remember 2009, however. It's more than just having our ducks in a row. I have nothing against kiosks or building bridges with those who have traditionally stood against us in the business community like the Federal City Council, but that's not enough. Now is the time to empower our delegation so that we can effectively finish the work for which we were elected. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. It would be uh, nice if you're willing to share copies of your statement with your colleagues here. I will. Um, Representative Garcia. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Happy holidays, and thank you so much for taking time to be here with us. Uh, let me recognize the presence of uh, Jesse Riddell, who is uh, the first Latino artist elected to represent the U.S. at the Olympics, who is with us, and he has one of his works that uh, he uh, contribute to us later on. Thank you so much for being here. Over the weekend, we also honor a number of DC State champions at an event, and I think one of them is here. Mike, thank you so much for the work you've done for statehood. Uh, you know, no doubt that when the 115th Congress started, we knew uh, what the outcome of much of our effort was going to be specifically that we weren't going to get statehood in the 115th Congress. But we, uh, while we don't need to pat ourselves on the back, we made some significant progress. Uh, and again, specifically the number of co-sponsors that we have on both uh, bills in the Senate and the House. So we uh, hope that uh, we can engage you at the end. I'm looking forward to hearing from some of you. Uh, and just uh, excited to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. 
Uh, and as everybody in the room can tell, we've been joined by the mayor's co-chair of the uh, commission. Mayor Bowser, do you have a statement? Thank you only briefly, uh, Chairman and colleagues. Thank you for your presence here today and to all the members of the public who are joining us. Uh, I am pleased to convene with Chairman Mendelson um, this this meeting uh, where all of us in the in the statehood um, commission um, can put issues on the table, discuss budget priorities, and discuss um, how we move forward productively together. Uh, you will hear uh, momentarily um, from uh, my senior advisor, Beverly Perry, who uh, is staffing um, our efforts, uh, in particular with, um, with uh, with our efforts that will be national efforts, and we will talk a bit about that uh, and take your questions. Uh, we are also very interested in hearing more ideas about what we can do uh, in the senior advisor's office in uh, the upcoming year in working um, with um, our congresswoman uh, with a new Democratic House of Representatives. So with that, uh, if, if it's all right with you, Mr. Chairman, I will um, uh, ask Ms. Perry to proceed with the remainder of my report. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Good evening. Well, the first thing I should say, and I didn't bring my copy, um, the what we have distributed for you today is, thank you, is our first statehood report. It is our annual report. Uh, we don't really, we call it 2018, a year in review and the path forward. And what the report does is it has two purposes. It's a snapshot of the city's efforts on statehood, and we also include efforts of all of the members of the statehood delegation as well as our grantees. And it also provides a historic summary of where we are. We think it is a good piece, and we hope you will take copies with you as a good as a leave behind when we go to visit members of Congress, when we go to other states. Um, we think it is a good piece to tell our story. So, um, and if you have comments on it, uh, we, we print in different editions. Uh, we would hope you would provide us comments and if we need to make edits to it, we will be happy to do that. Um, the highlight of the statehood report is it is a discussion about the uh, admissions act that was introduced by Mrs. Norton and that is the highlight of our efforts because we know that what it's going to take for us to gain statehood is going to be in the Congress. The Each House of Congress have to give us a majority vote and a signature by the President. We think that sounds simple but we believe that uh, you know, it's an uphill climb, but we believe that it's a hill that we are all prepared to climb. Um, if you notice the centerfold of the report, when Mrs. Norton introduced the bill, she had 133 co-sponsors at the time of introduction. We are now up to 178 co-sponsors in the House and 30 in the Senate. She's looking forward to introducing the next bill and the next Congress as part of the majority. And we are in discussions with her whether it's going to be the first bill introduced in the 116th Congress or whether it's going to be H.R. Uh, 51. So no decision on that yet, but we're looking forward to that. Other updates we have. Uh, and they are reflected in the report as well, is the kiosk. We believe the kiosk is a way to disseminate information. And they are information stations that are positioned around the city. We purchased three kiosks uh, in the past year. One is outdoor and two are indoor. One is in the convention center. 
each year we get a million vote, uh, visitors to the, to the convention center. So we thought that was an ideal place to capture people while they are there in a learning mode to learn about our city. We also have a screen with messages from the mayor in the convention center about statehood. And we um, have the uh, kiosk, one at the Reeve Center outside. And if you go past there, uh, you will see that it captures attention of people. And that is a high traffic area. And the other high traffic area is in Union Station. So we are very proud that we uh, achieved those accomplishments. The, um, some of the other efforts that we have underway is a mobile app. And we've worked with Octo to create an app that um, you can have on your phone. It's not quite active yet, but we're almost there. We've been working on it for some time. And people can, um, we, the message on the kiosk will tell you how to get the mobile app on your phone. And that way, you can always be in touch with us. We will send you uh, alerts about what's going on in statehood. And, and we can't ask you to do anything, but we hope that when we send you an alert, you decide what you want to do. We talked about last year our 10 state campaign, and we have, um, we purchased um, email addresses from different, from a database that includes people in our 10 states. We have in our database uh, 1.4 million emails, and we have sent 10 different emails to those uh, people in the 10 states. Uh, we've also increased our database with 600 family and friends, people that have signed up on our petitions at conferences, people that have um, signed up through the kiosks. Uh, so our database has uh, over 1.4 million people. Uh, we've gotten responses back from some of those people, so we think that is a good way to uh, keep in communications with people. And just to give you an example of the emails that we send out, um, for example, on Independence Day, we send an email right before Independence Day and say, you know, we are pausing to celebrate Independence Day, which represents the full democracy. However, the 700,000 people in the District of Columbia have not achieved that full democracy yet. And we do that, we did that around the Kavanaugh hearings. We just informed people that the Senate was discussing uh, or considering the appointment of a Supreme Court justice that would determine our future for years to come. Yet, we had no voice and we had no say we had no one to call to express an opinion. And the residents of the District of Columbia have that unique status uh, of people uh, in America other than the people in Puerto Rico. So those are some of the messages we have gotten out. We have visited uh, five different regions, attended national conferences, conferences of the state legislators, Conferences of the League of Women Voters, um, the um, Alex, we, which is um, a conference that is predominantly Republican, but we received a warm welcome there and met some people that offered to help. Um, some people from Pennsylvania came to visit with me. So, you know, these efforts, they seem, uh, they're few and far between, but it's a lot and with, with our staff. Uh, one other thing that um, uh, we thought about and the mayor considered, the mayor decided that how do we get the business community involved? There's a missing element here. 
So Mayor Bowser convened a corporate council, a luncheon with uh, 30 CEOs uh, that do business in the city, and explained to them that statehood issue is also a business issue, that we are short of senators, that when we consider other regions, if you look at North Dakota and South Dakota, uh, you look at a region of about five states, and all together they have about five million people. You look at our region, you go from Maryland, from the top of Maryland to the southern of Virginia, three jurisdictions which make up the greater Washington uh, region. We have 15 million people, and we have four senators. And you look at North Dakota, and that region, they have five million people and they have 10. So you, you do the math of how, you know, this can be a business decision. A lot of the issues that's before the Senate are business uh, issues as well. And the CEOs, they took heed. They, they, it, it caught their attention. And so when we asked them if they would participate in a corporate council, that we would ask the Federal City Council to chair, there was willingness. And we are in the uh, beginning of trying to, uh, not trying to, we're in the, in the early stages of forming that corporate council. And we know that many members of that corporate council can also help with some of the decision makers that will have to cast a vote. Uh, we also awarded um, our statehood grant awards, uh, and we did it this year early. We have um, we've heard the complaint in the past years that by the time we issued a RFP and people respond and they get their awards, they only have three or four months to uh, do the task that they are proposed to do. Uh, just last week, uh, within the past couple of weeks, for this year, we've already announced the awards for uh, for this year, which, you know, our fiscal year began October 1st, so we've already getting those awards out. So we're looking forward for, and the awardees are DC Vote, League of Women Voters Education Fund, Students for DC Statehood, Stand Up for Democracy, and Vision House. So we are pleased about that. The mayor said we would talk about going forward. The other thing that we realized that uh, in examining how do we tackle this and how do we get a better handle, what is our message should be. We have, um, we're looking at um, a consultant firm. We have to do some market testing to decide to determine what should our message be. We know that people have been out there for 40 years talking about the statehood message. But what is the message that is going to capture the attention of Americans? Americans in the West, Americans in the North, Americans in the South. How do we communicate to them that 700,000 people, a group larger than two states, have, don't have full democracy. We have no representation in the Senate, and we have no vote on the House floor. How do we communicate that message? And we know that, uh, in, based on some of the political campaigns that we have studied of how they got their message out, we know there is a way to test market, to test messages, and have people follow up and I, the way they explained it to me is that people, you get their attention and they go to the next stage and then to the next stage of the message. So if a message pops up on your computer, you say, oh, that looks interesting. I'll click on that. And then you click on the next one. And then you click on the next one. And you know, you can tell by that, the professionals that do this, uh, they can tell what the message should be. What is the message that captured the attention? And so 
we have an RFP on the street to uh, retain a consultant firm that's going to do that market testing for us. And we are continuing our efforts in our 10 states. We're continuing all of our efforts um, with our um, kiosks. We, they have been such a big hit, and I have to share this. We were, when we had the CEO meeting, we had um, the uh, person from the Capital One, and they said, oh, that kiosk sounds like a good thing. We'll take one. So we are ordering a kiosk, and we will ask other businesses if they will have a kiosk where there are high traffic areas for people out of town. And so, you know, sometimes we have not because we have asked not. So we're, we're, we're going to continue to be creative. We're going to continue to ask all participants, business, community, um, everyone, to let's come up with more ideas. How do we reach the people in America? Because let me tell you, the Democrats are going to be in control of the House next year. Mrs. Norton is, believes that she's going to have a hearing in the House and get a positive vote. And then we have to go to the Senate. So I say, if the Democrats in the House support us, the Democrats in the Senate should support us. And then we come down to, it could be that we just need five additional votes from the other side in the Senate. We have to figure out how to turn the Republicans' chairs in the Senate. And I believe we can do that. This team believes that we can do that. So that concludes my report, uh, co-chairs. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Perry. Are there any questions from members of the commission? Uh, let's go to... Um, what was item three on the agenda, which is uh, item four, which is a budget presentation by Senator Strauss. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Mayor Bowser. As well, in accordance with section 2.3 of the commission's bylaws, it's my pleasure to present the budget for the state's initiatives for fiscal year 2019. The current 2019 budget under the jurisdiction of the Commission is $242,454, consisting of $142,114 in personnel services and $100,340 in non-personnel services. Uh, the very first item in your folder uh, details it broken down by uh, object class group including 15,340 in supplies and services, 75,000 in other services and charges, and 10,000 in subsidies and transfers. Uh, of the non-personnel services, we continue to fund uh, what we consider to be successful stated initiatives, including uh, approximately 20,500 for our popular 51 stars public service announcement campaign, uh, 15,000 for outreach to targeted states, um, an increase this year, taking our international efforts up to 19,000, uh, as well as other areas for promotional materials, uh, office supplies, uh, $14,800 for Senator Brown's uh, Shadow Politics radio show, and $10,800 for Representative Garcia's um, award-winning uh, cable television show. Uh, we've included a breakdown of the personnel budget as well. Um, and we are <laughs> looking forward to uh, building on the success of past years with our budget this year. Uh, let me just say that uh, although uh, our budget continues to be a fairly modest uh, part of the city's overall state and spending, uh, I, I believe in uh, four terms of, of service that we're at a point now where the district as a whole is spending more on state when you take the delegation budget, uh, the efforts funded through the Office of the Senior Advisor, the grant funding um, 
we are, are, are having this uh, at an all-time high, and I think that's a, a, a good thing. Um, I want to thank people in the office of the senior advisor, beginning with Ms. Perry herself, Joe Leonard, uh, Eugene Kinlow, Rachel Williams, for the close working relationship that they've developed with my office. Uh, and uh, I hope that partnership continues into this uh, fiscal year as well. Uh, among some of the highlights, as I've mentioned from last year, we were able to get in plenary debate, the European Parliament debating whether or not the district's lack of status is a human rights violation. That's the kind of debate that's normally reserved for countries like China, Russia, uh, some of the, the, the really bad actors in the world. Uh, additionally, uh, as we look at some of the targeted states, we're finding that we have a, uh, a surprising and, and uh, bizarre problem with our friends in uh, the great state of Rhode Island, uh, a deep blue state with two Democratic senators that should be uh, our natural allies. And some have suggested that uh, they are reluctant to give up their status as the smallest state. And so <laughs> working with, um, uh, in, in partnership, uh, when Senator Whitehouse made a, a bizarre uh, remark on, on DC stated, we were able to get some of our 51 stars PSAs up and running right in the middle of a New England Patriots game where he himself turned out to have bought some time. So as he was watching his own commercial, he saw some of ours. <coughs> And we think that's the kind of quick, rapid response effort uh, that we're able to achieve. So um, I'm also honored that despite its uh, uh, relatively small size, that uh, through this process, um, the several hundred uh, thousand dollars that we have um, uh, generates the direct attention from uh, the mayor and council chairman themselves through this process. Uh, I uh, appreciate uh, my colleague's support, and I would uh, move approval of our spending plan for fiscal year 2019. So we have the spending plan before us, and the spending plan consists or is spread out among four different documents. It, There's a summary sheet. There is a summary sheet that mirrors the AR0 budget. Uh, you yes. also have reprinted from the actual budget book all of the supporting documents for the AR0 budget. You have the aggregate non-personnel money. You have, if you want, a comparison of fiscal year 19 spending initiatives compared with fiscal year 2018. Um, and um, you also have our personnel budget that breaks down the number of positions, funding the other with a, uh, uh, what I believe DCHR refers to as a Schedule A. Yes, and there are five individuals listed on that. Yes. Uh, so it's been moved and seconded. Is there a uh, discussion or questions from the members? Um, Senator Brown. Yeah, I, I would just like to say, look, we're not asking for a lot here. But we don't have enough money for each of us to have a full-time staff person. And that's not right. We have a woman in our office that works 24-7 for us that has no benefits. She has no health insurance. She has no vacation. She has no sick leave. We're supposed to be out there fighting for democracy. It seems to me that we need to increase this, the personnel side of our budget. In addition to that, there's $140,000 that's been given us by the taxpayers, which is being virtually held hostage by the commission, uh, and, and, and was just released, they just released $21,000 of $161,000. So you still have $140,000. We need to resolve these things so that we have a fully functioning office. They send volunteers up to the Senate that have little staff and uh, we're expected to change the way America's done business for 210 years. We need more money in the budget. Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator, yes. um, can, you, can you just reference the, the current budget and the fringe benefits sure. to see why um, I'm I don't, our, our expectation is that a full-time staff from D.C. government has benefited. Well, the, the problem is is that we have um, only 128000 uh, for our entire personnel budget. Uh -huh. So 
when the budget was initially, uh, uh, the problem is, in, so to increase our personnel budget, we would either need to take away from the non-personnel initiatives or we would need to get uh, an enhancement. Uh, we do have an enhancement requested for 20, uh, uh, in the 2020 budget, um, but this budget is appropriated by the council, and so we can pay some people. Uh, so within us today, we're limited with what the council gives us. Um, and in order to stretch that budget and have it uh, met, we've been relying on mostly WAE and uh, temporary personnel. Uh, the one new position we're creating uh, is to uh, bring a, um, someone who's actually been volunteering for over a year and a half uh, on this. Uh, and so we would like nothing more than to get that, but we're limited to a personnel budget that we, uh, uh, our budget comes through the council. Okay. Uh, as proposed by the executive. Okay. So, if, if I can interject, I think the issue here is that Senator Brown said that there are employees who aren't getting benefits. You have a, uh, in the budget, you have a, a line for fringe benefits. Um, so how is it that uh, fringe is not being paid if it's in the budget? Fringe benefits requires, uh, it is, um, a, a line item that the, the budget office has is, first of all, every employee gets some version of fringe benefits, but the way the budget for fringe benefits works is that we have to pay the employer's share of FICA Social Security. And so uh, our current budget is at, um, um, we have these different, basically to uh, pay the people we have, we have to take a small pie and whack it up. Uh, so we would like to be able to do that. We have, uh, but it would either mean cutting back on, on laying off some people, reducing it in force. I, I think that's missing the, uh, my, my question. The, the budget that the commission has it was uh, adopted by the council, mm -hmm. provides uh, regular pay plus fringe benefits. Correct. And then you're making the statement that there's no fringe benefits, but there is. There's not fringe benefits, Mr. Chairman, for all our full-time employees. And that's the point. There are fringe benefits. We have an employee that uh, receives retirement um, and receives, um, so, uh, you know, uh, health insurance and sick leave and annual leave. But that's one of five employees. The other four get nothing. Well, not nothing, but they don't get all those benefits. And they should. We shouldn't, you know, as a government, we shouldn't um, let employees that work on this really important priority, uh, we, we, we shouldn't treat them like second-class citizens. I mean, it's as easy as that. Uh, I'm still confused. The commission is without the ability to increase the amount of its budget. The budget was adopted uh, last uh, June. Yes. Okay, and the budget provides 142,000 for personal services and another 100,000 for non-personal services. Right. I believe the commission has the ability to, to reprogram if the commission wants to. The commission meaning the five of us, mm -hmm. so that uh, the you know, non-personal could be reduced and the personal services could be increased. Uh, you put forth a proposal for how to spend the 142,000 of personal services which I think we're prepared to vote on, but then the comment was made, well, but you have people who aren't getting paid fringe. I'm not quite sure how that happens, but we don't have the ability to increase the budget, and uh, I would have thought you would have worked that out before it was presented to us. In any event, there's $14,000 that's budgeted for a fringe, and uh, so either it's well, included or else uh, your agency fiscal officer would need to um, uh, I don't think it's appropriate for discussion here, but your agency fiscal officer would have to document how it is that you're paying people and you're budgeted for fringe, but you're not paying them fringe. Well, I think, it, I think if I could um, jump in, that the, it sounds like the, the, the delegation has decided to break up the regular pay 
um, that might at 127 be for a full-time staffer plus all the fringe. And instead of having one staffer, you have several staffers. Um, and you have split up the, the 127 plus 14 to cover as much of, of salary and benefits as you can. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, we, we simply can't get by on a single individual uh, staffing the entire three-member delegation. But one thing what we found over the course of time is that uh, the three of us are not always in the same place at different times. We have competing events. Uh, occasionally people, uh, if we literally have one solitary person in the office, uh, I, I, I think the problems are obvious. And so part of the problem we have with this budget is that one of the staff members uh, was incorrectly classified as a, a CFT position when there actually wasn't money in uh, object class 11, it was all object class 12. Uh, there was some confusion with the personnel office, and so uh, we would like to equalize the benefits, uh, and for that reason, we have requested an enhancement for the 2020 budget. Okay, so what maybe, before her what honor. could be confusing to others is that um, the, the budget that we're talking about, that you're advancing, <coughs> Um, it's just really explaining what's already been appropriated. Is that correct? That is the council correct. voted on this and this budget. The council, our budget, I presented last year, the council approved a budget that went into effect on October the 1st. Um, and what the delegation is advancing and then what's up for discussion today um, is outlining how that appropriated fund um, would be spent, 242. So we're not actually talking about um, all of the things that you would want included in a budget because the amount has already been appropriated and went into effect on October 1st. So what we are reviewing is how you would spend the appropriated amount. Um, so it is the appropriate time to talk about next year's budget um, and how the staffing and benefits might be increased for next year. Um, and we can sometimes, um, throughout the year, that I do with other agencies, is consider um, if there's been a mistake or if there's something that needs to be adjusted um, to handle that uh, through a reprogramming. Um, and depending on the size of the reprogramming, um, the, the council can um, then, then be involved. So what I may suggest uh, is that uh, my office work with you on uh, what we see as any, or what you see as any irregularities with um, with benefits um, and the, the types of hours that are people that people are working, and then we can bring back that discussion to a future meeting. I do appreciate. I, I appreciate that, Madam Mayor. We're still waiting to hear from the Budget Office on the 2020 enhancement, um, and uh, to the extent that there is, uh, I'm not quite sure where the council is in terms of the fiscal year 19 supplemental process. Uh, but that would certainly be one way to uh, address it as well. Um, sure. All right, so we have the motion before us, which is to approve the uh, breakdown as, as has been presented by Senator Strauss. Is there any further discussion? On the motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the ayes have it unanimously. Uh, we also have the minutes, which I, it says on the agenda we see, but probably we should approve them. The minutes were in the packet. They are uh, for the December 6, 2017 meeting. Uh, I'll move approval. Is there, are there any corrections to the minutes? Uh, all those in favor of the uh, approving the minutes as submitted say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the ayes have it unanimously. The, um, uh, the next item is commissioner's discussion. Uh, do we have more? Do we want to discuss anything? We want to bring anything up? Uh, then why don't we uh, see if there's public comment? We've done this before. Um, I'll start with you. If you would, because uh, this is being televised. What are we doing for a microphone? And why don't you identify yourself for the record? Uh, I want to first praise all the efforts of the commission for statehood. Anything that's done for statehood is uh, really welcome. 
Uh, I particularly want to praise Senator Strauss for his international efforts. I think embarrassing our uh, government, federal government, for its denial of our basic human rights is, is conducive to building a, a stronger movement, both uh, nationally and globally. I would also add the same applies to the climate denialism of our federal government and how this is an egregious human rights violation. Uh, I want to just make a point about, I know Ann Lyko, I think, is going to speak about the need to change the name uh, from Douglas Commonwealth because it conflicted with what was actually passed on November 6, 2016. Was it November 6 or November 8th? Well, uh, and any which was de uh, which was uh, New Columbia, say New Columbia. But I remember sitting in the council hearing on October 18, 2016, and the council general counsel was asked about this conflict, and she said, "Well, the referendum was just advisory." But I think the name of our state should be revisited in a real constitutional convention. We didn't have a real constitutional convention. It was five people voting on it. And uh, it, unlike the 1982 convention, uh, constitution, which was produced by an elected constitutional convention, and it was this constitution was extremely progressive, far ahead of its time, and all its progressive elements were eviscerated in what our commission came up with. Uh, just two more points. One, uh, statehood, getting state is about getting democracy. And I would also point out that our own council, uh, in their repeal of Initiative 77, really defied the democratic wishes of our own electorate. And that doesn't send a good signal to the nation about where we stand, about the democratic rights of our own electorate. And it wasn't the first time. Uh, finally, um, I want to uh, point out that on Friday night, we had the 10th uh, anniversary celebration of becoming the first human rights city in the nation. Uh, Council Member Mary Che uh, spoke at that. It was at the Black Workers Center in Anacostia. And uh, we have formed, reformed what we call the DC Human Rights City Alliance. And we are uh, getting participation of groups like One DC uh, in the objective is to make DC a real human rights city because political, economic, social, and environmental human rights are inseparable. And, and we've always felt that the uh, addressing uh, the priority of becoming a state, which is a human rights issue, uh, needs to be empowered by addressing all the other human rights violations, namely the high rate of child poverty in D.C., the homelessness rate, which six, over 6,000 children attending school are homeless. This certainly has an impact on the disparities of, the, of school performance in the city. So thank you for the time, and uh, I hope others join the D.C. Human Rights City Alliance to make D.C. a real human rights city. Thank you, Mr. Schweitzman. Yes, sir. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Bonner. I'm a comedic activist. Um, and um, I wanted to say, th first of all, thank you guys for your efforts, and thank you for um, opening it up to public comment. I think it's really important. Uh, I'd love to see a lot more um, engagement with grassroots activists and people who are here um, and having more opportunities for people who, uh, who don't have uh, fake jobs like me um, to be able to, <laughs> to come. Um, so I, I want to talk about creating a bandwagon. Like, how do we actually make this fun, exciting, 
new, engaging, innovative. Um, a lot of the stuff that's discussed and a lot of the stuff that is funded um, from the money that DC government allots is a lot kind of the same stuff that we've done. And the new stuff, the kiosks, it's like, it's really expensive. You know, you can give that to one grassroots activist and that can make a huge, huge person impact as opposed to just an electronic thing. And, you know, we're talking about finding the right messaging. You know, in this day and age, we can, we can target people with messaging. And we should think about how to make a full social media campaign. Um, how do we make this an exciting thing where people who don't give a crap about politics are actually able to be drawn in and actually able um, to feel like whatever they do is activism? That representing themselves, representing their city is a really powerful political thing um, I, I appreciate, um, I believe, Stand Up For The Sea did, um, did a statehood rap contest. I think that's fun and, and new, and I want to continue to think about new ways to do those kinds of things, um, and really including um, a lot of various different groups that are working on this in an actual, in the f official capacity. Um, and, and thinking about how there's lots of different ways to sell this, and there's lots of different ways to be thinking about this, and all of them should be included. Um, so, uh, and I want to also consider, you know, uh, Senator Brown has been doing lobbying um, at Republican offices. I've been doing some of that on my own. I've been trying to do some more subversive, weird lobbying that they don't quite know what to do with, and it's been effective. And um, so I'd love to, to think about how do we, how everyone who's working on this issue, using all different types of techniques, um, can work together, log lobbying activities, uh, we need to use the fact that we're here and that we are <laughs> right there. We can go on our lunch breaks. We can go whenever we want. And that's something that no other political issue has, um, that all the people who care about it are within 30 minutes of being at the halls of power where that decision gets made. Um, so I'd really love to have more of these kinds of moments and expand this, expand, like um, David Schwartzman was saying, um, expand so that there's an actual real convention so we can talk about not just statehood, but what will statehood look like? How do we include all these different ways of getting involved um, in, in the same effort uh, and not have it be everybody running around with their own chickens, like we're all chickens with their heads cut off and squabbling over different things, um, but have it be all of our statehood? Because I think that that is really that humanity and the authenticity that, would needed, that is needed for that would be um, hugely helpful for the divisions that have been um, laid in the city over the last couple of years. So I really, and, and also tying it to all these other human rights, um, uh, income inequality and other things, um, issues I think is really important. So um, please, please, I beg of you guys <laughs> to um, consider including grassroots activism and um, grassroots lob lobbying in these efforts and, and as part of the conversation um, and to really include young people, uh, new people and old, uh, to the city uh, who really care and love for the city in order to make sure that the money is used most effectively uh, and in a way that cascades and, and doesn't just happen in a little one-off thing, but makes a growing movement. Uh, and like I said, a bandwagon that people can jump off and be like, oh crap, this is happening. We can do this. Um, so that's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Just give a quick answer to this. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, we need more money. We need more money in order to do this. When you talk about priorities, if you're talking about state buyer being a priority, look at our other priorities. Schools, one billion dollars. Um, uh, affordable housing, a hundred million dollars. Uh, you know, a streetcar line on on Eighth Street, two hundred million dollars. And we talk about statehood and we put less than two million dollars a year into it. So that's one thing we have to do. Great question. Uh, Ann Lyko. Um, I, I sent the commission a letter today and I want to raise the really practical stuff. Most of the conversation has been about publicity and public relations and all that kind of stuff of how we get the votes. Um, and I'm really concerned we're not doing the real work that will actually make statehood happen. The first thing is we have a mess 
on the issue of the name of the new state. Um, I don't know legally at this point, and I would urge both the mayor and the chairman of the council <coughs> to check with their lawyers and figure out what they think the true legal name is, whether it's New Columbia, which was the one the 1982 Statehood Convention um, approved, and it was approved by the voters in November of 1982, and was the name on the referendum in November of 2016, or whether it's the name which is the state of Washington, Douglas Commonwealth, that the council um, approved back in October of 2016. If it's the latter, which has sort of been used in a form on the current statehood bill um, by Delegate Norton, it is a mess. It says we don't know what we're doing. You cannot be both a state and a commonwealth. You gotta pick one. You shouldn't have the name of your city in your state name. You start getting so long, and we also, as the people in the state of Washington, and I've seen a lot of comments and editorials about it, um, have a state of Washington. So to have another state of Washington with this Douglas Commonwealth tied on the end, it's just confusing. Uh, we need to pick New Columbia, which are the ones that's been approved twice before, well, we could pick Columbia, which was the name of the territory of Columbia in 1871 to 1874. We could pick Douglas Commonwealth, but you should under, which understand that doesn't necessarily give you D.C. as your postal code because the District of Columbia will still exist as the shrunken federal district, and it has already has priority claim to D.C., so you might get D.G. out of that or something else. Um, but I don't think that the Postal Code should govern what our name is. But the name is very important, and it needs to be corrected as soon as we can because it basically ends up as the title of the statehood bills in the House and the Senate, and we've got, we want to get new bills introduced and get, and get all those sponsors and co-sponsors that are on the ones now plus the newly elected people signed up on them. So we need to get that cleaned up. And it is much more difficult to change your name later than to go in calling yourself what you want to be called. We look like fools. Um, I would also point out, for those who don't know it, there actually is a board of geographic names um, in the federal government. And this, the name the council passed in October 2016 would not pass muster. Um, so that's the first thing, and I would urge you to find out legally where we, which name we really are at. If it's New Columbia, then it's fairly simple. We just use that for the title and get rid of all the rest of the stuff. If it's the state of Washington, Douglas Commonwealth, you got a mess, and somebody's got to act quickly to clean it up. And I would urge that there be, a, if you have to do that, that you get an effort to have public hearings, have town meetings, to do, do um, <coughs> surveys or poll or whatever, to go to ANCs to, to quickly find out what people across the city think the name should be. Um, the 1982 convention spent a long time and went through every possible combination you could think of before they ended up with New Columbia, if anybody wants to go back and check the record. The second thing is it takes time to create, in reality, a new state. And it's not just the vote in Congress and the president signing it. It's how you will get the institutions going, how you get the functions that have been federalized transferred back to the new state government or even before to the district government, how you get those that are by law jointly federal and state, like all of our land use planning institutions, which people don't often think about in this context, the Zoning Commission, the Board of Zoning Adjustment, the National Capital Planning Commission, the Fine Arts Commission, and um, Delegate Norton has bills regarding all of these things that most people probably don't even know exist. Um, there are other things like the control of the National Guard, which is the president, which would have to go to the governor. There are probably a lot of other things that I don't even know about, but what I would like to urge, first of all, the mayor to require every agency of the district government to do some minimal statehood transition planning and say, how would statehood affect my agencies or bureaus operations? How much money do I need in the budget 
to devote some people to do the thinking of what the issues are, to begin to start um, talking to the appropriate federal officials about how to work this stuff out, to start developing plans, to start developing, if needed, proposed draft legislation for the transfer. Um, I met on Thursday uh, the former and last director of the DC Parole Board, uh, Margaret Quick, who told me that it took three years to transfer the parole function from the district to the federal government. We're looking at a congressional timetable that could very easily mean that there's a statehood vote and possibly having it passed in 2021 if um, the 2020 election gives us a Democratic Senate and a Democratic president. That's a little over two years away. Um, we don't have much time. There needs to be money in the budget for transition planning and for beginning to ask all these issues. I would like to thank the mayor, who has actually been proactive on the parole side um, and had a, a, what do you call it, a request for application uh, to, for a parole for local control study um, about how to bring it back to DC, which closed on December 5th. We need proactive thinking like that, and it needs to start immediately because this stuff all takes a, a, a long time. And the council should probably also look in terms of the supplemental, how to get some things funded so that it can actually start, not just for proposals for the 2020 budget, but so people can actually be devoted to thinking about this stuff between now and um, next October 1st. And then the final thing I just wanted to Ms. mention. Lycos, you've been okay, what well, I just mentioned is, is, is to thank the, for the, uh, the grant that went to the League of Women Voters because there is an example of an organization that has hundreds of chapters across the country that has had to send out a statehood toolkit to each and every one of those and has been sending members um, to every place from Alaska to New Mexico to Hong Kong for folks abroad to all sorts of places and educating people about statehood because the one-on-one -on -one talking to other Americans and explaining our situation is by far the most effective way to get them on board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the line will end after Bo Shuff. No, the line Hi. will end after Bo Shuff. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Joyce Robinson Paul, and I'm, um, I have two things that I'd like to say. And one is um, that we're at a pivotal point in the District of Columbia as far as state, statehood is concerned. And we should have our three delegates, which are the senators and the House rep, they should be paid for their time and effort. The, uh, a consultant firm uh, would mean they have to get up to step or get up to uh, where they are. Mm -hmm. Nobody can get up to uh, par that quickly. That's why it's necessary to um, bring, on, bring on board our um, senators and representatives to be up there on the hill, be up there everywhere uh, Eleanor Holmes North needs them, but we should not continue to just look at them as uh, unpaid consultants. And we have enough money, we have a $15, $15 billion budget, there's no excuse for the three working as hard as they work and receive nothing from this DC government. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Capozzi. Good afternoon, Mayor Bowser. Uh, Chairman Mendelson and the members of the commission. I just want to thank you for the opportunity today. And uh, a couple things. First of all, I want to uh, State thank your name for the record. Uh, my name is John Capozzi, and I'm former shadow representative here in DC. And I want to thank Mayor Bowser actually for appointing Kimberly Bassett to uh, new secretary of the District of Columbia uh, as an alumni of DC Vote and having worked with her for several years on this issue. Just excited to see that uh, she'll be uh, working there. And then I want to thank Ms. Perry, actually, for trying to get more involvement from the private sector because we need their money, we need their commitment, we need their involvement, and anything else we can do on that, uh, I would certainly appreciate uh, getting a chance to help. And then I would mention that um, 
One of the things that um, everyone who uh, ran for re-election this um, turn cycle actually can do is to donate their uh, leftover campaign funds to the nonprofits that uh, are fighting for statehood. So whether that would be uh, DC Vote, Stand Up for Democracy, League of Women Voters, I just think that would be a great gesture in terms of helping with that. And then in terms of the funding for the delegation, I mean, the 2020 budget hasn't been written yet, so obviously I've always been in favor of paying uh, members of the commission. I think that's only fair. I think that any kind of budget increase would be helpful as well. But one thing that would cost the city nothing would be actually to allow employees of the district government to donate their annual leave to the delegation. Uh, that's a program that's in force now for people who are, you know, let's say sick or ill and uh, they have run out of their leave. But certainly there's a lot of employees in the district government who have over 240 hours and it's use or lose at the end of the year and they could certainly donate that to the delegation and that would be a big help. And then finally, uh, I would like to invite everybody who is interested in statehood who's involved to come out to the Martin Luther King Day Holiday March, which is gonna be Award 8 uh, this year uh, in 2019. I think it's a great chance for people to come out and express their uh, support for the issue and uh, everybody is welcome. It's free to march in the parade if you have a delegation it's fifty dollars if you want to have a vehicle, but uh, I think it'd be a great way for everybody to come out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Proposal. Mr. Shop. Hello, uh, my name is Bo Shop. I'm the executive director of DC Vote. Uh, I want to thank the commission for all the work it's done. I'll, I'm just going to be real brief. I wanted to let everybody know uh, that February 13th will be the Statehood Lobby Day uh, on Capitol Hill in conjunction with the Statehood Coalition members. Uh, so we invite the public, everybody from the, from the district, all of, obviously the elected officials as well, to join us. It's been a very powerful uh, activity for us and for the state of movement over the last couple of years. It'll be focused on all of the new members of the House of Representatives and the Senate. It's over 100 members total on both sides of the aisle. Uh, so we are looking forward to, to that day. I didn't put John up to suggesting donating excess campaign funds, but I think it's a brilliant idea. Uh, and that everybody should take that under consideration. But that was it, February 13th, just mark it on your calendar. Thank you all for very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, bear your, your indulgence. I would like to make a comment. Your name, please. Thank you, sir. My name is William Tav, and since 1995, I've been promoting a voter empowerment song to honor Dr. King in this city, and I've been shut down everywhere I go. This mayor's office has not turned to face with me. Her advisory office has not turned to face with me. I'm very saddened by that. It's a song that could have been used in a Democratic con convention to help the last election. We just had an election with voter turnout turned down. I'm a minority contractor who's been trying to get the Board of Elections to contract that song so we would lead the nation with 100% voter registration to demonstrate how much we are committed to voting in this city. It's a song that honors Dr. King and the Voting Rights Act. This upcoming year, the new Congress will be taking on the Voting Rights Act issue. DC should be up front with that conversation. It's only three minutes and 32 seconds so long, but it helped Obama get elected. It was the cornerstone to turn out the vote for 08. Anyone can look at it on YouTube. William Taft, PSA, 458,000 hits that encourage people to vote. So why is it that the masses receive it, but my city does not? As a minority contractor, I should not be denied the privilege to provide my democratic and patriotic efforts towards the mission of the Board of, the board of Elections. It supports their mission statement. There's no reason for it not to be contracted. So I'm, I'm sad that my mayor would create a pathway to middle class, but I can't seem to get one. And then I'm doing patriotic stuff. I've had mental breakdowns behind this since the last two elections, knowing I have something that is worthy of respect, patriotic, nonpartisan, down the middle. I spent $5,000 to do it, but yet I can't get five minutes from my elected officials, be it the council or my mayor, to be received. It's been very disturbing to my heart. So I think you give me the privilege to speak now. Let me just say, um, Eugene will follow up <coughs> with you about um, the link, and we'll definitely review it and suggest some opportunities for you to showcase it. Well, I've been told over and over again that it violates say, the, the just, hatch, the that's, hatch that's law. A, that's just say yes. It and, does not, though. Okay. Well, I won't argue with you then. I gave you an opportunity that we could interface. You can accept it. Um, 
or it's that's been, what we I've been interfaced with him before and got no response, so I don't know what that to expect. That is a response. So you did interface with my office? With, with him directly, okay. yes. I provided with him. You, they they, they know about it. That's why I'm saying nothing's about happening. About what we found out. What did you find out from listening to the... Uh, there are a number of... Well, there are a number of songs that have been developed on voting rights in D.C. statehood. The question was and the best way to promote it. Uh, and last year, we talked about doing a contest, one that would, one, broaden the base instead of just selecting one song that would, you know, that we're just picking out from a small group of people that we know. We, we, we said that we would like to broaden that opportunity among the arts and humanities community, the music community, to find larger vehicles for us to, to share our music. So okay. we're still... We're still in that vein. That's a, that's a good suggestion. Um, and maybe uh, also some of our grassroots organizations would take that would take that on as well. Well, we have the song Statehood that was done to honor uh, Chuck Brown. It leads to the, the song on that statehood. And my song is with voting rights. So we have two great songs so far. To create a new competition doesn't make sense. And you, can, you haven't considered the ones that's on the table. They were national artists that did it. I'm a local artist that did this. So I don't understand why that's the better thing to do. Let's have a competition now to see what's out there. You know, those two things are done and honored and received by the people already. So again, I don't understand why it's always maybe if and and a but, never a solid consideration. So I hope that that will happen, that we'll be able to sit and look at these two songs and then put those artists on tour around the country with a, a, an exhibit showing what statehood is. Culture is used around the world to promote America. Why can't we do that in D.C. to promote that around the country, to have thank these artists lead the fight? Okay, thank you for your comments. May, yes. may I, may you, uh, if I could also, uh, this is not, I don't have, uh, my TV show is not on air on CNN, but I do have a show, and I would love to have you come out. I'm going to give you my contact information, and uh, we would love to have you. We are uh, air uh, once a month on D.C. TV, and I think you'll be a good addition. I think that... Senator also has a yeah. uh, radio show I've that pitched a song that goes nationwide, and I think that he would also contemplate. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I hope that the, the persons looking at this show today will support the Voting Rights Act in D.C. and in the Congress coming up. There will be major marches there. I hope everybody will be involved, and I hope that the Vote D.C. will expand its outreach to people being involved because there's not many people being involved okay, in your outreach you, service. Thank you. Yeah. Um, lastly, uh, with the commission's indulgence, I want to put a couple of dates on everybody's agenda. But before I do that, I wanted to formally announce um, that I have appointed uh, Kimberly Bassett. And if Kimberly would stand so everybody could see her as the Secretary of State. And as uh, Mr. Cabosi mentioned, um, Kimberly comes with a wealth of experience, including um, having worked on statehood issues um, at, at D.C. Vote. Uh, so I look forward to uh, Kimberly's service to the district as she serves as the interim uh, secretary for the district, and, um, and we'll start the the new year strong uh, and uh, let me also announce uh, with the council we will be formally announcing uh, the official swearing-in activities uh, for returning members and new members of uh, the district government uh, including the swearing-in <coughs> of the mayor the attorney general the council chairman six members of the council uh, two members of our statehood delegation. You go. You go next, um, <laughs> and A and C commissioners. Uh, that will happen as is required by our charter on January the second, and you will get formal invitations. Uh, I will also host an interfaith um, service as we did four years ago, um, prior to the start of our swearing-in activities. Uh, I will also host um, with uh, other city officials a big celebration uh, event, um, and we will get that information out um, about the location and how you can participate uh, this week. Uh, we hope um, that the statehood activists uh, will be a big part of, of that celebration. There will be free events, um, and uh, if you have some fresh ideas about how to showcase um, statehood during those activities, uh, I would love uh, to hear them. So that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Oscar.
colleagues, if there are any other comments, closing comments, uh, Senator Scott, Senator Brown. I, I'd just like to say, since we're on the subject, and the mayor brought it up, we have three people here who work every day on statehood, and they work really hard. Uh, Karen, Mike, Angelie, could you guys stand up? I mean, y you know, they really deserve a round of applause. <laughs> and, and, and they do all the work. We, we get all the glory. They do all the work. Thank you. Uh, thank you. If there's no further business, uh, we, we will have our next meeting, I'm hopeful, uh, in April. All right. We, uh, yes, we're looking at uh, beginning of April or possibly sooner will be the next meeting of the commission. And with that, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.